Pan Pan Psychast. Part two continued, or part two B, the plot. So we broke up part two into two weeks because we're doing an in-depth look at the plot of Albert Camus' The Fall. It's going really well so far. We're enjoying it, aren't we, gents? Yep. G- good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Once again, uh, I think just after the talking about how we wanted to approach this episode and how Ollie just kind of just jumped right in and did the first reading and we were, uh, me and Jack stood in astonishment at just how amazing this man was at delivering these <laughs> monologues and hopefully that came across sincere you <laughs> yeah very uh, sincere I do uh, genuinely that was great I really enjoyed it uh, and I hope the listeners also found that bit enjoyable and we and as it went we realized it was so good that we had to uh, give the audience more uh, and so we're now breaking it up into part 2b where we're going to uh, explore the last bit of the plot as Jean-Baptiste Clément well, he uh, he reveals himself to be quite the uh, disgusting person. <laughs> <laughs> Go back and make sure you've listened to the last installment. If you haven't so far, we found John Baptiste in a bar in, in Mexico City. Um, he starts telling us about his life, how good he was. And then one day... Uh, a woman chucks herself off a bridge and he's haunted uh, by this laughter of the fact he didn't do anything. And he realizes he's quite selfish. And that's where we ended uh, in last week's installment. Um, but no, we're, we're enthralled. And uh, so, Ollie, you, please don't keep us in limbo any longer. Can you give us uh, a reading of chapter four? A toy town village, don't you think? Yeah. They didn't go easy on the picturesque here. <laughs> oh, it's it's hell here. A soft hell, it really is. Um, nothing but straight lines. Uh, no brightness, colour, no open spaces. This this is truly a dead place. Oh, where are we? We're in Marken. Uh, the island of Marken. This is where I've taken you. Uh, reminds me of Swindon, actually. I visited it once. But most importantly, apart from the deadness, no people could sir. Just you. And me. Hey, notice the birds, notice the doves, good sir. See how they circle and wait up there, year on year, round and round. Oh, you don't understand what I mean. Oh, oh, I apologise. I, I must be tired. Um, I no longer have the clarity of mind that I, that I once had. Um, I was speaking earlier of my friends. Uh, and when I say my friends, by the way, uh, as a matter of speaking, good sir, I, I have no friends anymore. Only, only accomplices. Um, on the other hand, the number of those has grown substantially. The whole human race, good sir, is my accomplice. With you in number one, first place. The person who is here is always first. Oh, how do I know that I have no friends? Oh, very simple. I found out on the day when I considered killing myself in order to play a trick on them. To punish them. Well, it might have been able to commit suicide and see the effect on them. And why, yes, it would have been worth it. Why do you look at me so good, sir, to kill myself? But you say, but you kill yourself and it doesn't matter whether or not they believe you. You are not there to witness their astonishment, their contrition, or to take part in your own funeral, as every man dreams of doing. You'll pay for it, a young girl said to her father, who had prevented her from marrying a suitor who was too well turned out. And she killed herself. But the father didn't pay a thing. He loved fly fishing. Three Sundays later, he went back to the river. To forget, or so he said. They always think that people commit suicide for a reason. But one can be very well commit suicide for two reasons. Well, sir, I think we're talking around the point. Let's get straight to it. I like life. That's my real weakness. I like it so much that I have no imagination when it comes to what it is not. Well, now, after everything I've told you, what do you think? Disgust with myself? Come, come. If I were disgusted, it would be chiefly with other people. I knew my weaknesses and I was sorry for them. But I went on forgetting them with an almost commendable attitude. While in my heart, good sir, I never ceased to judge others. Surely you must be shocked by that. Perhaps you think it's illogical. 
It's not a matter of logic, good sir. The matter is to slip past, and above all, oh yes, above all, it's a matter of not being judged. We have to take the same precautions as someone who tames a wild beast. If he has the misfortune before going into the cage to cut himself while shaving, what a feast for the creatures! I realised that all at once, on the day when the suspicion arrived that perhaps I was not such an admirable man. Now, this may come to a, a, a shock to you, sir, but the moment when I saw that people would judge me, I realised I had this uncontrollable desire to judge. Yes, they were there, as before, but they were laughing at me. That I had enemies in my work, at home, my family, my social life. Some I had obliged, others I should have obliged. An aura of success, good sir, when it is worn in a certain way, would drive a donkey to distraction. May I remind you, sir, that I was one of the most successful lawyers in all of Paris. You are only excused for happiness and success if you generously agree to share them. But if one is to be happy... One should not worry too much about other people, which means there is no way out. Happy and judged, or absolved and miserable. And I would say, good sir, as a piece of advice to you, most of all, don't believe your friends when they ask you to be sincere with them. All they want is for you to sustain them in the good opinion that they have of themselves, and provide them with the additional assurance that they take from your promise of sincerity. How could sincerity be a condition of friendship? Ah, look at those birds overhead, good sir. Look at them fly. We confess to those who are like us, and who share our weaknesses. Uh, this means that we do not want to correct ourselves. We don't want to change, good sir. We just want to be judged and be found wanting. All we need is pity and to be encouraged in our life. Sir, I know you are a book of the Bible, as we have spoken before. Do you know Dante? Really? The devil you do. So you will know that Dante allows for neutral angels in the disagreement between God and the devil. And he places them where, sir? You know it well. Limbo. A sort of waiting room for his hell. My good friend, we are in the waiting room. And if I'm honest with you, good sir, staring out of this horizon with you, I have never been able to believe deep inside that Human affairs are serious matters. Of course, I did sometimes pretend to be taking life seriously, sir. Who wouldn't? But the frivolity of the seriousness itself very quickly became apparent to me, and I merely continued to play my role as best I could. I played at being efficient. I played at being smart. I played at being the most pious, a very worried and concerned citizen. I indulged. I was indignant. I was supportive of Shining example. You remember the, the famous phrase, good sir? Look, you, you hear it. Uh, Woe betide you when all men speak well of you. Ah, the person who said that was a wise one. Woe betide me. It was at that moment that the idea of death started to creep into my daily life, good sir. In fact, I was followed by a ridiculous fear. One could not die without having confessed all of one's lies. Now you look at me with those eyes, sir. Of course I shook myself out of it. What did the lie of one man matter in the history of generations? How conceited was it to want to bring into the light truth or deceit? It would be lost in the ocean of ages like a grain of salt in the sea, or a planet in a galaxy, or a galaxy in a universe. Sir, I was a lawyer. I was one of the best lawyers. Regularly I would train other lawyers and was encouraged to give speeches. Remember, I am very well thought of. I remember one afternoon giving a speech to some trainee lawyers and I was, I was talking about this or that. I, I can't really remember. I remember my speech was impassioned and I remember it was good. But in the middle I suddenly began to think of my guilt transference of guilt as a tactic for the defence. I became confused, impassioned. Uh, I may not have directly killed anyone. I am not guilty of that. 
but I may have let things die. Oh, I, I think the tide is coming in, good sir. Our boat will be leaving soon, and the day is, is drawing out. Um, we should probably make our move back to Amsterdam. Oh, oh, you seem quite keen on the judge penitent factor. Well, good sir, I think before we talk about that, uh, we should talk a little bit about debauchery. Beautifully read again, Mr. Marley. What a treat for our ears that was. Uh, Jean Baptiste in the flesh. The incarnation of Jean Baptiste is in the building. Thank you once again. So we're just going to riff here and just pick up on a couple of the main themes. And uh, the one really hits home for me nice and early in the chapters. This he's talking about death and how it frees us. So there's this girl who uh, who kills herself and in in. Uh, in spite, I guess, of her father, despite her father. And he doesn't really mind. He likes fly fishing. He, now he's got all this time. Uh, so when someone ends their own life, John Baptiste is saying it, it allows us to, to get on with it. It's not something which you, you end your life despite somebody. In fact, you free them. It does the opposite of, of what your intention might be. So there's this idea of death. Does it link with this idea of judgment that he goes on to focus on throughout the chapter? Yeah, I mean, I think he, he kind of alludes to the fact that like he he loves life too much and maybe he like he just loves himself so much that he mm. couldn't bear to the idea of committing suicide but then that leaves him with this really kind of awkward situation which is that he like he was in great anguish with himself this sense of guilt uh, but he can't take that way out uh, and so he has to find a way in which he sees like possible to kind of live and he he comes to the conclusion that he should confess all things in a way of sort of absolving himself of the guilt and he like as you said there's a lot of judgment going on because he feels that like he judges others hmm. uh, but there's also just countless amounts of judging from from everybody that there's there's no escape from it and he gives that nice example when he's asked to talk to some i guess trainee solicitors about uh, you know some advice for the future and he starts to talk about this idea of uh, transference of guilt and he gives the example of, of kind of interrogating somebody on the stand and how it's i guess hypocritical of somebody to challenge them because at us ourselves can't do we can't throw the stone so to speak because we ourselves are sinners so it's it's that everybody is guilty and that the world judges everybody and you have enemies in your social life and at your work which you just can't escape uh, so that's that's what i took from here if you are prepared to say look at how flawed i am uh, i can point out your flaws too but the thing is is that he says that everybody else is just hypocritical <laughs> right so yeah. they go on judging but can never admit guilt in fact they mm. hide away from it they they are terrified of the judgment of others but they do it all the time and it is, I mean, there is an element of truth to that. Of course, we'll we'll keep that for analysis. But it's a it's a fascinating little theme of this chapter. It's kind of the key bit. I love how he ends it again. Before I explain about judges penitent, I have to speak of debauchery and little ease. Uh, so he doesn't even tell us what judges penitent is still yeah, he's, at the yeah, end of this yeah. chapter. Although I kind of feel like at this point it's reasonably obvious. Whoa, but... that sounds like meaning to me, <laughs> Andrew. Um, the only, yeah, the only other bit, and uh, Ollie included this in, in part of his reading as well, is uh, he refers back to Dante again. He's done this a couple of times. Yeah. And it, you know, he talks about the idea of us being in the waiting room. He just says um, we're in limbo. That's where we are, doesn't he? Yeah. And it's just that sense of the, the waiting room for hell. is like it's, Again, it's a waiting room of judgment. Hmm. And that we're all doing it to one another. Alrighty, our penultimate chapter. We're looking at chapter five of The Fall. Uh, we're joined by Jean Baptiste, aka Mr. Oliver Marley. Ollie, um, in your sexiest reading voice, please. Let's sit down on these deck chairs. What a mist! So let's let's just let's just have a little step here and uh we're going to get to the little ease in a moment. But first, let me tell you about my reaction to judgment. Now, I realise that I have not really loved anyone. I realise that the romantic books, the romantic literature, it teaches you to speak about love, but it doesn't teach you how to make it. After loving a parrot, I had to sleep with a snake. So I looked elsewhere for the love promised by books, which I had never encountered in my life. 
For more than 30 years, I had only been loving myself. But this love is truly impossible. You couldn't possibly find a truly selfless form of love. I finally decided that what remained was debauchery. And sir, I can see you smiling. I can see what's going on in your head. I led the most debaucherous lifestyle, good sir. I was dying to be immortal. I loved myself too much not to desire that precious object of my love. It should never vanish. I slept with whores night after night. I drank nights and nights on end, being sick of... <laughs> There's a part to quote you out of context in the podcast. Yeah, yeah, this is it, yeah. So, kids, uh, episode three of The Fall. <laughs> I slept with whores night after night. I drank constantly, day and night, for weeks on end. The next morning, of course, I had the bitter taste of mortality in my mouth. But for long hours, I had glided blissfully. And every evening would be the same. More drink and more women. To be honest, alcohol and women have been have, have given me the only release I deserved. I am entrusting this secret to you, good sir. Not just good sir, my dear friend. Don't be afraid to make use of it. Then you will see the true debauchery is liberating, good sir. Why? It creates no obligation. In it, one possesses only oneself. So it remains the chosen occupation of those who truly love themselves. And that reminds me, good sir, I, on this ship, just watching watching the mist, I'm remembering the last time I was on a ship. Um, I was staring out into the ocean, into the broad horizon and the waves, and I remember seeing a shape. I remember seeing a black spot. You know, occasionally there are shapes in the ocean, whether it be another ship, a boat, or just waste floating in the water, especially around here. Looking out at that black spot, I turned and saw it again, and it had vanished. And I felt this urge to call for help, to shout, to scream. And then I saw it again, and I just was struck, good sir. I remembered the woman on the bridge, the drowned person. It was that, without protest, as one resigns oneself to an idea that one has long known to be true. I realised that the shout I had heard many years earlier, echoing across the river behind me, had not ceased to travel across the world, carried by the river towards the waters of the canal, and over the limitless expanse of the oceans. I realised it too, that it would continue to wait for me, on the seas and the rivers. In short, wherever there was the bitter way of my baptism. So, sir, you know now I am in my little ease. Don't wait for the last judgement, good sir. It takes place every day. Oh, that? Oh, it's nothing. I'm just cold. Damp. Anyway, we're here now. Um, let's, let's not talk too much longer. Come. I haven't finished. We must go on. More and more prophets and healers appear, rushing to produce a good law or a faultless organization before the earth is a desert. Fortunately, I am here now. And I am the end, and the beginning. I announce the law. In short, I am a judge penitent. Yes, yes, I'll tell you tomorrow what the fine profession consists of. You're leaving the day after, so we haven't got much time. Come to my house, would you? Ring three times. So, again, Ollie, if you don't mind me saying sorry to flatter you, uh, you might end up as arrogant as uh, Jean-Baptiste if we carry on, but wonderfully read. What was the... What's Jean-Baptiste getting at here? <laughs> that the while. classic pants like <laughs> It's literally the audio book that we made. It's literally me asking that for about <laughs> yeah. 24 hours yeah. straight. Uh, so what are the key plot points? The, f the first one, what would you say? Yeah, so I, the way I, I kind of see this is that he's once he's realized just kind of how guilty he is and how, like, how bad he feels about himself. Hmm. He, he sort of just thinks like, oh, well, screw it. Might as well just kind of embrace the, the, the lifestyle, as it were. I might as well just almost live authentically for once rather than Shut holding myself, myself in the back. river. Yeah. Uh, and so he, he just he goes on a life of debauchery. He sleeps with loads of prostitutes. He drinks loads of alcohol. He just, uh, he just indulges in all of the bodily pleasures, has little care about it he doesn't feel bad um and he does the, in the morning doesn't he, he said something well, he like, does, in yeah, the morning like, i feel the mortality again of course but like but he's it's a type of escapism 
but so what I would say is, is that like it's still he wouldn't do this unless he didn't like like it's some in some way want it right mm. um he's just indulging in that part of his personality a lot more freely than he ever would have done before and it also yeah it says that like, he, his, he began to creep through into his uh, his professional life, but he still managed to kind of at least hold a bit of the facade there. But in his own private life, yeah, he would he would just kind of do whatever he felt like. Um, however, interestingly, like, as you've you kind of said, yes, in, when he would wake up in the morning and you feel mm. the hangover and the kind of depressing nature of it all, yes, he would reflect. And more importantly, when he's going on this voyage, he said that like he you know he was given it as a gift by a friend and then that's when he sees this floating piece of rubbish out in the ocean and like again he realizes that he, while he's trying to escape his past and he's trying to like do anything to to kind of absolve himself of this guilt mm -hmm. it's there again this like this floating piece of rubbish out in the ocean is just him thinking about the woman who was floating in the river and how that he wants to call out and help but he is unable to do anything there's a couple of lovely lines in 65 I just want to give. Uh, to be honest, alcohol and women have given me the only release I deserve. And then later on that page, he says, you know that even very intelligent people feel flattered at being able to empty one bottle more than the next man. Yeah. Oh, that was a great little off-the-cuff line at the end there. Um, I swear in this chapter, I can't find it. I'm skimming through like a madman. But it, there's a part in here which he references waking up in the morning and feeling essentially hungover as a type of fall. And it's always worse at the dawn. Is this something which you came across as well? Or am I, am I thinking of a different chapter? Yeah, no, I'm no, sorry. I'm not sure. But there's, I mean, definitely along those lines, he, there's... But it fit in with this dialogue, wouldn't it? He's trying to escape uh, through uh, sex and alcohol, essentially. And in the morning, he feels like he can't reach those dizzy heights again. He feels mortal again. And um, so although he's embracing this life of debauchery, uh, he still is haunted by some kind of laughter when his mind is uh, unintoxicated again the next day. He, he seems to... Is it a cough or something that he has towards the end? Uh, he says, oh, never mind that. And then he asks him at the end, uh, come to my house, would you? Ring three times. So he's going... Uh, the next day he's leaving. Uh, so at the end of this uh, penultimate chapter, uh, the, the, his interlocutor, who hasn't spoken throughout the whole book, uh, hints that he gives him some responses. Um, said, oh, he says, oh, you're going back to Paris. It's a long way. Paris and I haven't, I haven't forgotten it. I remember dusk there. Uh, he tells him to come and ring at his house. And that's where we begin chapter six. Here we go. We're going to jump into the final chapter of The Fall with Ollie. I'm judging you. <laughs> Well, good sir, I'm embarrassed to receive you lying down. Oh, do not worry, it's nothing. Uh, the temperature, I'm drinking as much gin as possible to try and get rid of it. <coughs> Malaria, I think, but I picked it up when I was Pope. What does it matter, after all? Don't lies in the end put us on the path to truth. And don't my stories, true or false, point to the same conclusions? Don't they have the same meaning? So what does it matter whether they are true or false, if in either case they signify what I have been and what I am? Please, sit down. I know you're looking around the room, and I know what you're thinking, good sir. It's very, very bare. No books, no tables, no furniture. It's like a coffin in here. Uh, and that's because, sir, I'm only concerned with my confession. In any case, I only like confessions nowadays. So no, no more books, no furniture, no neat and polished cutlery. This is my coffin. Now, have you locked the door properly? Yes? Just check it for me. Forgive me. Thank you. I'd also like you to block the door of the tight little universe in which I am king, pope, and judge. Actually, open the cupboard, please. Ah, the painting. Yes, take a look. Don't you recognize it? The just judges. Oh, you're not surprised. Is this a gap in your general knowledge? Though if you read the papers, you'd remember the theft from 1933, that of St. Bavon Cathedral in Grand, of one panel from the famous Vaniac Maltabis, the mystic lamb. The panel in question was called the just judges. It showed some judges on horseback on the way to adore the sacred animal. 
It has been replaced by an excellent copy because the original was never found. Well, here it is. No, I didn't have anything to do with it. A regular in Mexico City, whom you saw briefly the other night, sold it for a bottle to the gorilla one drunken evening. No one would even recognize that it was the original, not a single person. So what harm is it doing in my cupboard? The profession of judge penitent is the one I am exercising at the moment, good sir. Usually my office is at Mexico City, but a, a great vocation extends beyond the place of work. Even in bed, even when I am running a temperature, I am working. In reality, this is not a profession that you exercise. You breathe it constantly. Now, what I say is guided, guided by the idea, naturally, of making laughter cease, of avoiding personal judgment, although there is apparently no way out. But my story, good sir, well, you are unaware. I, I closed my lawyer's practice in Paris and travelled. Uh, I tried to set up under another name in a place where there would be no shortage of clients. I set up my practice in a bar in the sailors' quarters. You get a variety of clientele in the ports. The poor don't visit the, the richer parts of town. For some time now, I've been practising my useful profession of Mexico City. As you were able to observe, this consists first of all in making a public confession as often as I can. Now, good sir, I know you're looking at me, and you're thinking that I accuse myself often. But the more I accuse myself, the more I have the right to judge you. Better still, I incite you to judge yourself, which relieves me by that much more. Don't laugh. Yes, I could see from the start that you were a difficult customer, but you'll get there in the end. You can't help it. With intelligent people like yourself, you need to spend a bit more time. I was wrong to tell you the main thing was to avoid judgment, good sir. The main thing is to be able to let oneself do anything, from time to time, loudly declaring one's own unworthiness. I still love myself, and I still use other people. It's just that confessing my sins permits me to start again with a, a lighter heart, and no, not to gratify myself twice, firstly enjoying my nature, and then a delicious repentance. So I'll wait as long as I need to for you to come and pay your respects of Mexico City, good sir. Excuse me. I'm going back to bed, I'm afraid. I've got overexcited, though I'm not crying. Sometimes you lose your way and doubt the evidence, even though you've discovered the secrets of a good life. All right, all right. I'll stay here quietly. Don't worry. And don't put too much trust in my emotional outpourings. All my wild outbursts, they're contrived, good sir. Ah, now that you've been going to tell me about yourself, I want to know if I've achieved one of the aims of my gripping confession. You are the member of a fine profession, a lawyer in Paris. I knew we belonged to the same breed, good sir. So tell me, please, what happened to you one evening on the banks of the river? And how you managed never to risk your life? Say the words that for years have not ceased to echo through my nights and that I shall finally speak through your mouth. Young woman, throw yourself in the water again, so that I might have once more the opportunity to save us both. A second time. <laughs> that would be rash. Just imagine, dear colleague, if someone were to take us at our word. You'd have to do it. Brr. The water's so cold. But don't worry. It's too late now. It will always be too late. Thank goodness. Thank it. <laughs> Thanks for clapping over that one, Jack. <laughs> Sorry, it's just yeah, so the end is so great that Jack had to ruin it <laughs> all in one take. He couldn't as help that well. Ollie was stealing the show. And Jack and his <laughs> arrogance <laughs> stomped all over him. Long live Jack, they say. <laughs> It's okay, he judges us regularly. Only fine. Shall we uh, save our analysis of the sixth chapter, so part three, the meaning? Uh, let's jump into a game of mystery. <laughs> <laughs> the Mystery Philosopher. Welcome to this week's Mystery Philosopher. So last time round, Andrew guessed that it was St. Augustine of Hippo who said the honours of this world, what are they but puff and emptiness and peril of falling? <laughs> Andrew, I can't believe you got the last one. It was excellent. Uh, thank you. Really impressive stuff. Mm, so do you, want, do you want this week's? I've got a new I, quote I, for you. I think you're going to give it to us anyway. How many crimes have been committed for no other reason than the perpetrator could not bear being in the wrong? 
That's Albert Camus. That's, that's Albert the, Camus. The, the that was read. in the book we we literally. I think I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> that I've got no more mystery philosopher quotes. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> I didn't think you'd get the first one, to be honest. I, we, maybe we'll play a little bit of the after show quiz next week because yeah. there's, uh, there's three different questions. So hopefully you won't. Oh, yeah, that's going to ruin it. Ma- OK, don't worry. I've got a full week to think about it. <laughs> 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 the laughter haunts me. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)